So I got this video message the other day. Bro, how the hell does this tower get held up by these? I don't get it. Don't worry, bro. I have you sorted. Sky Tower is more than just a tower and a tourist attraction that people come to see to watch out from its observation deck. It's also the heart of the communication tower communicating around the wider area. So it really has a vital role in the infrastructure in Auckland. It's also right in the middle, making it hard to build. See, Sky Tower is impressive not only just for its slenderness, but also its height, raising to a height of 328 meters, towering over everything around it. It was dreamed up in the 1990s to not be only an iconic part in the skyland of New Zealand, beneath its sleek interior is a marvel of structural engineering. So let's start with the primary structure, which is the central shaft. The central shaft is 12 meters in diameter. Doesn't feel that big, does it? And it varies from a thickness of 500 millimeters to 350 at the top end. So you need the thicker area at the bottom as that's where most of the load is. So as you're going up, you're trying to trim it down to reduce the amount of weight so there's not so much structure needed below. The central shaft was cast up in essentially one bit using slip form as they rose up through the middle, slowly rising it in almost a continuous pour from top to bottom. Around the shaft is the eight legs that you can see that really stiffen up the structure and give it the stability that it needs. This is truly just a cantilever element. So it starts at the bottom, cantilevering off the base. Now with any cantilever, you need to have the stiffest part at the bottom. And this is where these eight legs actually allow you to achieve this. So they're around the outer perimeter, allowing you to stiffen up the structure at the base so it doesn't have as much movement. And you may see, they're actually detached from the overall structure. How can they actually work? You see these legs are not really attached to the structure until about 260 meters. So if you're looking from the outside, you can see it going all the way up. And this is where you have that collar that's doing all the stiffening. So it's a stiff collar at the upper levels. So when you think about it, as a tower tries to move, it pushes down onto these legs. They have the added problem of not only do those legs need to get up there, they also need to be preloaded as you're going up the structure. You want to make sure that it's truly stiff because if you move a little bit, you get elastic shortening. So you want to have a lot of preload in the structure so it stiffens up the whole element. So they did this through having hydraulic jack that preloaded these legs before it was set to about 500 tons. So after that load was preset into them, they grouted them up so they'd be locked into place. So there's a preload to allow that structure to stiffen up from those outer legs. So as the building builds, it has already got that preload that it has to overcome before it actually moves even further, making the structure incredibly stiff. But you may be thinking, you've got all this weight, you've got all this preload, what is actually supporting it down below on the ground? And surely that's gonna create a lot of difference in movement. You see, at the base, there's a two and a half meter deep raft, similar to the collar at the top. There's a stiff raft section that allows the building to go really stiff. For those that are thinking about it, if you're looking in a small room, that's about the height of a small room depth of solid concrete. This pad is more than just the width of the building. It's 25 meters in diameter with 16 piles going down 16 meters to making sure that it's founded on solid material. So with pouring such a deep raft, you need to be careful with the heat dissipation in that raft as that can add additional stresses and capacities into the system. So what did it do? They added thermocouples and had a specific mix that could cure over time. So you could leach the highest strings that you needed so it didn't set too quickly, but also monitored it to make sure there was no effects and overheating in the middle. So that's just some of the engineering just behind the base of the structure. But how was it actually designed? Surely you're just doing the base structures, but they actually pushed the codes to the next level. They went to higher design capacity than you ever needed to in the heart of Auckland. As the engineers realized the true catastrophic nature if this building ever failed. So it's been designed for a level eight magnitude earthquake, which is far higher than anything around it. So many that's designed for much higher loads than you would ever need to for anything around it. So it will be safer than anything there. But it's also designed for higher wind. As you can see, it's very tall. So it means that it can be more greatly affected by the wind and the movement of the building. In addition to help dissipate some of those resisting stresses, it was designed to not need a tune mass dampener, but to help resist some of those nature of the building moving backwards and forwards and reducing the fatigue on the building, a tune mass dampener was added at the higher level. Essentially what a tune mass dampener is, it is a counterbalance of a weight of liquid potentially at the top of the building that will allow it to rock backwards and forwards, counterbalancing the movement, reducing the magnitude of the load. As, you, as you've got this counterbalance force from momentum, allowing you to slow down the movement and reduce the stresses in your structure. This is quite common on a lot of high rise buildings, not only just for strength, but also for potentially for humans of perceived comfort. As that rocking, if it's moving too fast, you can feel like you're swaying on a ship and who really wants to be up there and get seasick 
on a building. The next problem they ran into was a lot of construction problems. As it was already at the heart of Auckland, how can they get so much concrete in? How can they get so much finishing going? in such a bustling area. They had to do it in several ways. Some was management, some was noise control, so only building at specific times of the day. The legs you may notice is got specific joints as it goes up. See those legs were built off site and brought to site in a completed form in a precast fashion, meaning that you can take all the time to cure it properly, leading to a better finish and having less time on site as it only needs to be craned into place. Also the central shaft was done in that continuous slit form method, which you quite often see in places like Melbourne, New York, and other places that do high-rise buildings. But it was really innovative to do it in the heart of Auckland. So SkyTower is more than just an impressive tourist attraction or towering by its height. It also has modern marvels of engineering hidden inside it that can't be seen to the naked eye. If you want to see another impressive marvel, I've got a link to a video about the engineer behind the tallest building in New York. And feel free to send me other video reactions on buildings that you'd like me to review. And if you're interested in supporting your channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. As always, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.